Hey, I'm going to jump right in this morning. Uh, we're continuing our series today on how to read your Bible. And um, we've been looking at this idea of how we can become better students uh, and, and better readers and engagers with uh, our holy text, the Bible. Uh, and it's been really great. The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, the, the one of the three forms of literature that we find in the Bible, narrative. And, and we talked about the plot, what the, what the different plot lines within uh, the Bible and how we can look and identify plot and where in the plot of the overarching theme or each individual story we may find ourselves. Uh, and then two weeks ago, uh, we talked about character. What does characters look like in the Bible? How, what can we learn from these different characters and, and, and the, in the Bible and how God it's this ultimate character that we see from page one all the way to the last page of this story. Uh, and then last week, we took a little break. Pastor Andrew came and gave a really uh, just encouraging, compelling message. I was super thankful for Pastor Andrew last week, and I got the chance to speak over in DK, which was a blast. I had so much fun, uh, and I will tell parents at that age, uh, don't tell them any secrets that you don't want them to share because they will say anything over a game of Connect Four. Uh, they will let all your secrets out. Uh, so if you don't want it to be known, don't, don't tell them, uh, cause they will, they were telling me all sorts of great things. It's like, oh, that's great. Uh, it, but it was super fun. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, and it, and it was great. And today we're going to talk about another element of, of, of understanding narrative in the biblical perspective. So we, we understand plot. We understand character. Uh, there's a third thing that you're going to be familiar with because we see these in movies and, and books. Uh, it's the idea of, uh, setting, right? Setting. And that's where this thing is taking place. Where is the story taking place? And in movies or, 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 or uh, novels, we, we kind of have these ideas of setting. If you see a show and it opens up in a courtroom, then you kind of have an idea of what we're going to be looking at. If it's an old abandoned house, uh, you know, you may know what's going to happen and you know you shouldn't go upstairs, you should always go outside. Like that's just kind of the, the thing. If it's this coffee shop in Paris or a rainy day in Seattle, you know it's about to be this just romance movie that they just don't make anymore, right? I mean, that's just what's going to, uh, that's what's going to happen. So we have these ideas. I'm, I'm particularly, you know, I like Westerns. That was like, I grew up watching Westerns. I don't get to watch as many now, but like you, you kind of know when something has this, uh, this kind of opening Western theme, you're like, oh yeah, this is going to be a good one. Uh, and then, you know, I've already belittled and, and got in trouble for making fun of Hallmark movies, but they also have a setting slash theme, some small town just outside of some big town that is where everyone knows each other. And it's really great. Uh, you know, you know what's happening, right? Setting. And so setting uh, it matters because it kind of gives us this I idea of what we can expect in this world, right? Uh, and it, it helps you understand mentally where we're at. That's why when, when authors write books, they take some time painting the picture of the world. What does this world look like? How do we understand what's, what's going on? What is that setting? And if there's anything unique in that setting, they want to make sure you know that there's unique things in this setting, right? And so... Uh, that the, the more outlandish or, or unlike our reality uh, their world is, the more they have to kind of explain what is going on, right? And so we, we, are, we are understanding what setting looks like because we, we see it uh, all the time. Um, but biblical setting uh, is really important. Like there are many different places in which we see the setting uh, of locations uh, or, or times or different things that we can look at that really will Im impact us. And, and and as we continue to talk about this, and we've, we've shared this, I've said this a couple times, the Bible is not just meant to be a book that we read one time and then we're done. In fact, the first time is like this primer that then allows you to go back and read everything else in light of what you've already read. It's this thing that's continuing going back and forth. And so the Bible actually encourages us to keep track of some of these things like setting in our minds to understand how, the, how they work. So, because we, we'll hear different places and you probably heard these things, things like uh, Babylon or Moab or the wilderness or Bethlehem, like the, these places that they have things that these key stories happen in these areas. And since you and I don't live in, in Israel now, and we definitely don't live in Israel then, uh, and although I'm sure some of you have been, the, the majority of people haven't been there to see these places. It's not like we hear the name and it's like, oh, I know exactly what that looks like, right? And one way we could fix that is if we all just got on a plane and we went through a Holy Land tour, and it'd be really cool, and I hope to do it one day, uh, but like that's not the only way that we can learn about these geographical locations and the significance. 
if we understand that the detail that they're giving us, the fact that they tell us where it is, and the fact that they tell us what, what this location is, it's not just giving us the context, it's always important to the narrative itself. Remember, the ancient Israel, this, this, this writing style that, the, that is used is very compact, and, and they, they are very sparing with their words and with their details. So if a detail is given, it's with purpose. Just like when we talked about if they gave you a character trait of someone, if they described a physical attribute, it was important to the story. Well, it's the same thing with the setting. If they tell you a story is taking place at a certain time or a certain place or a certain area, uh, it is important to our story, and we should keep track of how these things combine together. I'll give you an example. I got two examples today that I want to walk through. One, we're gonna, I'm going to just kind of give you a brief overview, and then another we're going to read together and kind of see what some of these things look like. So here, here's an example of a location. And you probably, I'm going to say the word, and you're going to get ideas, right? You'll get images, right? Egypt. Egypt. Just think about it for a minute. Some of you think about Prince of Egypt. Some of you think about that great soundtrack that came from that anime cartoon. Some of you maybe are old school, and you think about, like, Ben-Hur, and you go back to some, like, you think about other stuff. Charles and Heston playing a certain character. Like, you've got some really good things that are going on when I think about Egypt, Right? But Egypt is this place, this location that's throughout the Bible. And though most times where we think about Egypt, we think about Moses and the Pharaoh and let my people go, which is good. That's actually not the first time we hear about Egypt. In fact, the first time we hear about Egypt, Abraham was called out of the east from his area, where, which is actually where ba Babylon is going to be. He's called out of that area and with his, his, his family, and he moves to the promised land. And upon arriving to the promised land and, and moving to this place, and God makes all these covenants with him, gives him all these promises. When he gets there, he discovers that the land is in famine. So things are not growing. There's not rain. Crops are not prevalent. The sheep can't graze. Like there's issues. And he's at this point where he just moved his whole family. He trusted God to come out of the land of his parents. And he comes to this area that God promises him. And then he's immediately faced with a test. Will you trust that God will provide even when you can't see it or not? Well, what does he do? He ends up going down to Egypt he goes down to Egypt because they have provision there, because Egypt doesn't really experience famine because they have the Nile and the Delta, so they always have water. And so he goes down to Egypt. And remember, the Bible doesn't give you any contextual narrative of like, and it was wrong. It just lets you see, it lets the character in the story speak for itself. This plot speaks for So he goes down to Egypt, and even though the Bible's already told us that Abraham's old and Sarah's old, something's going on because they get down to Egypt, and the Pharaoh, the king of everyone, the one who can do whatever he wants, sees Abraham's wife, and he finds her very attractive, very beautiful. So it says that he takes her, and, but before he takes her and to, to be part of his wife, he goes to Abraham and says, oh, this woman's so beautiful. And Abraham says, oh, yeah, her? That's my sister. Wow. Because he's afraid that if he says that's my wife, that the king will kill him and then take his wife. So it's like, oh, her? That old thing? It's just my sister. You can do whatever you want, which is crazy. But that's what he does. And guess what? Remember, does the Bible say, and Abraham was an idiot, and he said it was his sister. No, it allows you to infer that as the reader. You see? So he goes, and all of a sudden, before he marries her, before he sleeps with her, the Pharaoh with Sarah, all of a sudden, even though Abraham went there without God telling him to, even though Abraham then lies, even though Abraham just rejects this stuff and is like, oh, whatever, God shows up and says, I have a covenant promise with you, Abraham. And he begins to release plagues on Pharaoh in his household. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh's like, something is wrong. Something's wrong. The moment I started to talk to this Hebrew woman, I all of a sudden had plagues. So what happens? He goes back to Abraham like, hey, anything you didn't tell me about? He's like, oh, yeah, that's my wife. And he's like, you could have really done some bad things. So he says, and this is crazy, okay? He says, take your wife 
And oh yeah, all this treasure and gold and resources and leave. (laughs) What? And then he goes back up to the promised land. Abraham did nothing to deserve that. But this sets up this picture about Egypt, about Egypt. And, and, And listen, his son, Isaac, It says that Isaac grew up and Isaac got married and then Isaac was in the promised land, living in the promised land. And then guess what? There was a great famine in the land. And Isaac was faced with a decision. Do I go down to Egypt or do I stay in the promise? And Isaac, though he makes his own mistakes, Isaac didn't make the same mistake as his daddy because he decided to sow in the land. And the Bible tells us that he sowed in the promised land and received a hundredfold return in a famine. You see, that's the thing that God, he didn't, he, he trusted God. He said, you know what? Abraham, my father, didn't trust you. And yet you were so good, you still delivered him. But I'm going to trust you and remain here and remain here even when I don't see it. There's a message right there for some of you. Some of you in a situation where you don't know what's going on, you feel confident that that's what you called, you feel confident about what God's doing, and you look around and say, I don't think it's working, and maybe there's this thing, like I should run over there, or should I go here, or maybe should I try this, or I should work on this, and God's saying, can you just trust me? I'm walking through this personally. Trust, which sounds so easy, and yet is so hard. I trust you. I trust you. And so he does that. But we know, fast forward later, Jacob, there's a famine, third generation. Three years, of fa- there's this famine. And what does Jacob do? After he'd already lost his son Joseph, who had went and had created all these storehouses, we know the whole story about Joseph. He, there's a famine. What does he do? Does he stay in the land? Does he learn from his dad who stayed in the land and was prosperous? No. He sent his children down to Egypt to get resources. Now, for sake of time, they end up moving to Egypt, the Joseph, the whole thing, and then the brothers and the cup and the thing, and and then they move to Egypt and they get prime real estate and they're living large down in Egypt. But remember, did God ever tell them to go to Egypt? Did he say, that's the land I promised you? Went down to Egypt. And in fact, through a prophetic word, he told him, you're going to go to Egypt, but guess what? I got bad news for you. You're going to become slaves. That's a bummer. And over the time, that's exactly what happened. The entire nation of Israel, as it grew, it grew, it grew, it grew. It became dangerous, and they became slaves. And in that process, Pharaoh began to say, I'm going to kill the, the, the sons of all these people because I don't want them to multiply. And that's how we get the whole story of Moses being cast in the river and being pulled out. But then look how the story repeats that we're we're in Egypt. So what do I know about God in Egypt? God hears the cries and God rescues his people even when they don't deserve it. And now we get the same story, different chapter of God showing up and saying, these are my people and they let them go and they say no. And what happens? Plague after plague after plague, just like the Pharaoh before. And now these Pharaohs are getting plagues. And what happens? They end up being released after the death of the firstborn sons. And they are so upset. They say, just leave. And oh yeah, here's all of our gold. It happened again. It happened again. The same story. Just like that Hallmark movie. (laughs) It happened again. They lived happily ever after again. Can you believe it? It happened again. And he sends them out. And guess what? It keeps going. Egypt keeps showing up. Solomon, at the height of everything, what does he do? He marries an Egyptian princess. And then he begins to trade in horses. And I know you think, well, what does that have to do? Uh, Nothing other than God specifically said in the Bible, literally specifically said, don't buy horses from Egypt. Like it was really specific. And Solomon literally did it. And you're like, why? I don't know why. He just said, don't do it. And he literally did it. And what do you know? It ended up being a plague on Solomon. Now, fast forward. Jesus is born. The wise man come. The wise man leave. King Herod's upset. 
Jesus is told, Jesus, his father is told, they're going to kill your son. You need to escape. Where do you go? Dun, dun, dun. Down to Egypt. Oh, no. Don't bad things happen in Egypt? But wait, this is different because God told them to go down to Egypt. What are we seeing here? So he goes down to Egypt and says that King Herod begins to kill every male child under two. Oh, wait. Haven't I heard that before? Wasn't there another person that was killing every child under two? But wait, that was in Egypt. And now this is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Egypt. Jerusalem is broken. Jerusalem is oppressing Jerusalem is killing. Jerusalem needs to be redeemed with the death of a firstborn son. Oh my, plot twist. (laughs) What was supposed to be the place you went to to disobey God and you needed to return to obey God, all of a sudden those have been reversed. And the place that was the promised land has now become the place of slavery and in bondage. Oh, and guess what happened to Herod? The Bible doesn't even give you this detail. It says that Herod died and Jesus came back. Do you know how he died? This is disgusting. I'm just gonna tell you. The Bible doesn't give us details. It just says he died. But what they should tell you at this point is, oh, you should assume it was plagues. You know why you should assume that? Because that's what happens in Egypt. And this was Egypt. So this is what it says. They they did some modern studies and they took the information from the time because we have a lot more records of that era. And it said that uh, what King killed Herod the Great was an agonizing, uh, painful death that he suffered with for many years, which was chronic kidney disease complicated by a very uncomfortable case of maggot-infected gangrene of the genitals. Plague. Plague. Why? Egypt, oppression, punishment. The story goes and goes and goes. And see, this setting, this setting, we see it all the time. It can be something like a location like Egypt. It can be this idea. If you want to have a fun study, look at every time where it says someone moves to the east versus when they move to the west. Every time you move to the east, it's bad. You go to the east, Adam and Eve were kicked out to the east. Cain and Abel went to the east. Babylon was to the east. Israel gets exiled to the east. But every time they go to the west, it's just like, go west, young man. The West is where it is. Listen, you don't want to go down anywhere, but you want to go up. You go down to Egypt, you go down to Sheol, but I go up to Israel, I go up to the mountaintop, I go up to see God. These are situations, these are settings that you can see in every single form that help you understand these connections of where we are going. There's another fun thing that talks about these, like 40 years, 40 days, 40 nights. It's this ideal of faithfulness being tested. Is your faithfulness being tested? Are you, are, that's what we see over and over and over again. And what we see often is failure of 40. Failure of 40 until Jesus, who went 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting and then was instantly tested and then passed the test on your and I's behalf. 40. It's a setting. It's a setting. And in fact, it should be echoing to every other 40 that was a failure. Noah went in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights, and yet he came out and he sees the, the rainbow, and it's like, oh, that's great. And then he got drunk. He failed the test. 40. Sometimes, too, in the setting, we can also pay attention to, this is important, this is a thing, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about this, and we're going to read last, one last one, uh, is the difference between um, the narrative time and time of narration. Let me tell you what that. The time of narration is how long does it take to read a particular story, right? So like I can read this story in like 10 minutes, but then there's the narrative time of in that 10 minutes, how much time went by? When you're reading the story of Abraham, you'll actually be really surprised that sometimes decades go by in a five minute period. 10, 20 years can go by. 
And, and we need to pay attention to how much time. A great example of this is the, cha- the book of Mark. The first 10 chapters of Mark is three years of Jesus' life. That would take you about an hour to read. But then all of a sudden, the last six chapters of Mark is the last seven days of Jesus' ministry. 33% of it takes six chapters and it's the same. Why? Well, because it's the death, resurrection, and burial. The authors are telling you something. This is important. Slow down. We should always be slow, but it says, listen, we're, we're going to tell you this, we're going to tell you this, we're going to tell you this, happened, and then, and then, and then immediately, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, also it's like, mm. Jesus enters Jerusalem. Slow down. This is it. And we see that all the time. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are like literally thousands of years, and then all of a sudden we slow down to three generations of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we need to pay attention to how long, not just how long does it take me to read it. How long does it actually take? The entire book of Deuteronomy was one speech. That's real time. It was one speech. Deuteronomy is real time. That's why it's really boring. It's real time. There's no speed it up. However long it takes you to read is however long it took for them to read it and to give it out. It's real time. There was no editing for it. Like, it's just like, okay, here we go. Which is why when you read Deuteronomy, you're like, Bleh. Now we're going to give an example. We're going to read. We're going to read. We're going to read. Okay? This is the same story I got to share with the kids last week. But now we're going to go a little deeper. Genesis 22, 1. Sometime later, how long? We don't know. What happened before this? Oh, Abraham finally had Isaac. Oh, and he also kicked out Ishmael. (laughs) Here we are, sometime later, a year, a month. Well, we'll know by context, it's a little longer than that. It says, God tested Abraham's faith. A test. He tested him before. He's tested him a couple times. He's failed every time. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here am I. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, who you love so much. Now, wait a minute. Is Isaac his only son? No. He has another son. Different baby mama. He has a son. It's not the son of the promise. It's not the son of the inheritance, but it says... Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, in case you were curious of which only son I'm speaking of, and go to the land of Moriah, not Carrie. <laughs> Some of you got Christmas on the brain already, I know. Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. What? On one of the mountains, I'll show you. Moriah. And you and I, we read this, and it's like, what a pretty name. Or I don't know what it means. Here's one thing you need to know. This is where Solomon will build the temple. Is here. Where the temple is today, where there's controversy today in Israel, this is here. This place. This is why Muslims claim access to the site, because Ishmael, whose dad was Abraham, had a holy sacrifice here, Mount Moriah. But he says, go and sacrifice your son. And if we've read anything in the Bible, and if you've read the Bible through before, and you read anything about kings, you realize that God detests human sacrifice, especially kid sacrifice. So what's going on here? Well, it's a test. It's a test. It says, the next morning... This is verse three. Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set it out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day. Now you being a Christian should all of a sudden perk out. On the what day? On the third day? Why does that resonate in my heart? Something happens on the third day. Third day is important. But on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, this mountain top. 
Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there and then we'll come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. Now, you may not know this, but the Hebrew word for wood and tree is the same word, etz. There's no difference. It's the same word. So it says he put the tree on his son's back, which is why I'm telling you Isaac's probably a little older than like three, because I don't think he's, you know, <laughs> trucking a two-year-old up there carrying the, uh, a bunch of wood on his back. Maybe he was jacked, I don't know. It says he put the tree on Isaac's back and they walked up to the mountaintop in Jerusalem on the third day. So then Isaac starts looking around and he says, Father, we have fire. We have wood. It's also inferred like, and I saw that knife you had. <laughs> but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? Now, it doesn't tell you this, but what it tells you contextually is this is not the first time Isaac has offered a sacrifice. How do I know? Because he knows what it takes to offer a sacrifice. And there's one important thing missing, the blood. Where's the blood? You got the knife, you got the fire, you got the wood. I'm carrying this wood on my back. We're walking up this thing. Where's the sheep? Where's the blood? Where's the sacrifice? Where's the thing that we heard from our ancestors that cries out to be revenged? Where's the thing that covers? Where's the thing that will be important moving forward? Where's the blood? And then Abraham re responded, in the New Living, it says God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering. It, it, there's actually a reflexive, for it's actually, and it brings down other translations, but what it really says is God will provide for himself a sheep for the burnt offering. And Abraham answered, and they both walked together. When they arrived at the place where God had told them, at this mountaintop, Abraham built an altar and he arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on that boy, the angel said. Don't hurt him in any way. For now, I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld even your son, your only son. Same words. Now wait, before we keep going. Angel of the Lord. Most scholars, myself included, now that I'm a scholar, I'm a not scholar, but most scholars and then myself, believe that anytime you read the word, the angel of the Lord, that specific term, that, that title, it's not just an angel, it's just not a, a, another deity, it is, it is Jesus himself. So now Jesus has shown up. Now, how do I know that? Let me tell you just a quick one, just John 4, 12, 49, it says, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it, and I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the father says to say. He's the messenger, the angel of the Lord. So he comes and it says the angel of the Lord came. So now all of a sudden we have Abraham and we have Isaac on Jerusalem at the mountaintop after we carried the wood and Jesus is there and said, don't harm the boy. Your son, your only son, that's not your only son, but your one and only son. Then Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught in the thicket. So he took the ram and he sacrificed the bird offering there in place of his son. In exchange, in place. And Abraham, that name Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, listen, to this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Who's that telling it to? 
on the mountain. This is a setting on the mountain where there's trees and where there's God and there's man. Sacrifices happen that change everything. What does it change? It says, then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you've obeyed me and you've not withheld your son, your only son, third time. I swear by my own name, Jesus, the father, that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the stands on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and uh, uh, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. See, now it's, it's created a setting. It created a setting. Anytime I see man in high places, and I see wood, and I see sacrifice, something's happening. And we see it over and over again. We see different stories over and over again. And we see these little moments of restoration. We see moments with David. We see moments with Solomon. We see moments with different uh, prophets. We see moments with different judges. We see moments when hearts are turned back. But it all points to this ultimate moment where Jesus puts the cross on his back and he walks up the mountaintop and God said, I love you so much that I will not spare my son. Yes, my only son for you. And now when we see the setting, we say, oh, this is it. This is the moment. This is the moment that we had so many precursors. But plot twist, this was the very people that he was coming to save that were actually killing him. But I know, I know because of the setting that what it means is salvation. It's salvation. It's salvation when man goes up on those high places with God and sees the tree and the sacrifice because God wouldn't spare his son. Yes, his only son. Yes, his only beloved son. That's why when Jesus was baptized, he said, this is my son, my beloved only son, and I'm well pleased. This is it. And guys, this example is not a unique example. This is the only one I had time to do. This is all throughout the Bible. Settings and motives. We're gonna talk next week a little bit about design patterns and I'm really excited about it. And which we can see and as you read it and you read it again and you read it in light of all of a sudden, all of a sudden these stories start to connect and you realize, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, this is a moment. There's a reason it's telling me he's crossing the Jordan. There's a reason that he's in the wilderness for 40 years. There's a reason that he went to that city. There's a reason he went to Samaria. There's a reason he talked to that person. There's a reason he said, we gotta pass through this way. There's a reason he brought up Jonah and the third three nights in the belly of the whale. There's a reason that he decided to go to that garden and pray. There's a reason because all of them are connected to other stories to help you see the setting, that this wasn't something that God came up on the fly, that from the very creation of time, the moment that man sinned, he was creating a way for you to come back to him. It was a very long process, but it was thought out and the story was written. And so when God meets you today, and he meets with you today, It's not by chance. It's not by accident. It was with intention. It was with purpose. It was not coincidence or happenstance. The creator of the universe who wove everything together to work for the moment in which you can have an encounter with God and that time when you were worried and he came and he brought you peace or that time that you were afraid and then he was able to bring you joy or the time you experienced loss and even in the middle of the loss and sorrow, he was able to comfort your heart. These are moments that God has written from the beginning of time. And when you find yourself in a setting, you may all of a sudden realize, I feel like I've seen this before. Then the word of God becomes life and alive to you and you can see yourself in the story and realize here God is again meeting me and not for the first time 
And we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that we are part of a faith that goes back to before Jesus was born, yet was very much active in the story. This is why spending time in our text is so important. Because you'll see yourself in the setting. You'll see yourself in the character. You'll see your life in the plot. And you'll realize the same God who delivered Abraham, the same God who was faithful to David, the same God who did that for Ruth, the same God who worked for Esther, the same God who was faithful, that same God who sent Jesus, his only son, to die on that same hill. He loves me. He loves me. So I can trust him. He loves me. So I'm going to trust him. And Jesus passed the test. So you don't have to even be tested that way anymore. What a beautiful God we serve today. I wanna to do this, I wanna pray, and then we got one more thing before we, we dismiss. I just wanna to pray to, to allow God and the Spirit to kind of wrap a bow on this, and I got one more thing I wanna share with you guys before we dismiss. So Father of God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your Spirit, even now, because I know what the Spirit does, is illuminating other stories and other connections and other settings and other things all throughout Scripture and people's minds. And Lord, if they're here, if there's one here who maybe they're feeling like, I haven't read enough Bible, and I'm not really getting illumination, I'm not making those connections, Lord, I pray that they can understand that it is just part of the journey that we take one step. And we start with one verse and then we move forward and we allow the spirit to reveal itself there because Jesus said the spirit is in you revealing you all truth and everything that you need to know. So Father God, I thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Okay, church. I got one more thing. It's the first Sunday of the month, and this is where for the last uh, you know eight, nine months, we've been uh, collecting a special offering for our children's building. We've still been making steps, and I've got an opportunity uh, today to do something that will see immediate benefit, both in our current setup as well as in the setup that we're moving forward towards. Uh, but, uh, and, and so many of you, I just want to also say thank you, because so many of you, whether we've highlighted the offering or not, have been faithful to give in these uh, building offerings towards our kids' programs and our process of wanting to move our kids' classes closer and remodel and all the different things. It's been such an incredible journey that we're walking on. Progress has continued to happen in every way, but we've got one thing that I want to share with you that I think is pretty, uh, uh, it's a pretty cool thing because it'll be a pretty big game changer. Um, we are in need of upgrading, and we had it in our plans, it's in our budget, but we want to move forward with it quicker, of upgrading our uh, security systems, our security cameras and some of the different pieces. We installed those uh, in, in 2016, uh, that when we, we did that. And since then, uh, we've kept them, but a bunch of them have died and broken and technology's changed. And so we're in need of an upgrade. To be able to upgrade the whole campus, all the kids' classrooms, the main lobbies, all the different pieces, the meeting rooms, it's going to cost right at $8,000. And that's, and that's when we install the cameras ourselves, which I don't like paying people for installing cameras because I like doing cameras. It's kind of like therapy to me. I like to get up there and pull the camera. So I, I like to do it. So I'm going to do it myself with the, the team. But so uh, that's a ramble for nothing. But $8,000. And it'll not only move forward with where our current class is, but it also takes care of us uh, in the immediate need because we've had some uh, equipment failures from old stuff. And so if you want to give toward everything that comes in this offering is going towards the kids building, but that's a movement that once we get that, that money we, within a two, three week window, we'd be able to see the results of those things immediately accessible. And when we move our classes over, it'll all move with it and it'll be uh, already pre-wired and pre-prepared. So if you'd like to give in today's offering uh, towards that, it's going to be great. I know the security team probably is like fist bumping and giving high fives back because they've been uh, just kind of having to operate blind in a few areas. So 
it's going to be really great to be able to do that. And it also leads towards keeping our kids safe and protected uh, in all those classrooms. And so if you want to give today, I really thank you. I encourage you to do it. I'm going to pray over today's offering. We'll pass the buckets. I got one more uh, announcement as those pass, and then we'll, we'll dismiss, and I'll bless you on the way out. Father, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for what we're building here in the future. Lord, thank you as we collect this offering uh, towards this goal and this vision that you've given us, Father God, as a church, that you will continue to provide and allow us to accomplish it in your timing. Uh, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, and the last thing I want to encourage you in as, they, as we pass the buckets, um, and this was a thought I had this last, this last week, um, always remember this. As we continue to study this Bible, I love studying the Bible. I'm passionate about the Bible. I don't know if you can tell, uh, but I really like it. But always remember this. The reason that we're reading the Bible, the reason that we're studying, the reason we want to become better students of the Bible is not so I can put like a plaque on my wall. It's not so I can lord it over other people. It's not so I can get in these real witty debates. I want to become a better student of the Bible. I want to read the Bible more. I want to understand it more because it is one of the ways in which my heart can engage and become closer to Jesus and that he can speak to me. That's the motivation. The motivation should never be a task. It should never be a religious duty. It should never be uh, a, out of guilt or obligation. It, it's an opportunity for me to come. And I, say, I share that with you because what I want to, 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 in this process to do is I'm, my goal is to, ch is to encourage everyone to take one next step in whatever that reading journey is. So for some of you, and this is, I mean this with absolute no guilt and no kind, like literally none. For some of you, that means just reading your Bible at all. Like at all. And that's great. That's incredible. Just a little bit. For some of you, it'll be from once a week to maybe three times a week. For some of you, it'll be from every day for five minutes to maybe we just double it for 10 minutes. For some of you, it's just kind of loosey-goosey to maybe we try to do something a little more strategic in that process. And I'm going to lay out some things over the next couple of weeks of ways in which we can engage the Bible. But the only reason we're loving the, this is not levels. This is not, oh, well, look at I'm a level seven Bible reader. And you are just a dumb level two, so I can't even associate with you. That's not, these are not levels, right? This is just how do we continue to grow? How do we continue to grow and have his heart transform us? How can I see the fruit of my salvation through Christ manifested in my life? Well, spending time in the word is one way. It's not the only way, it's one of the ways in which we can experience that together. So I never want us to lose the focus. This isn't a class. This is something that completely changes our life and our hearts. Amen? All right, hey, stand up. I wanna, I wanna pray for you. Also, I'm gonna have people stand up and sit down a lot more. I went to a Catholic monastery a, a couple weeks ago, and boy, I mean, my glutes were burning by the end of that service. <laughs> And I thought, you know what? I don't feel bad making them get up two or three times now. It's going to help you. Uh, they told me, uh, uh, there were some Catholic people with me, and they told me they called it massercise. Massercise is what they, they called it. Uh, and I was like, boy, I was feeling it. Uh, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word that's alive and well. Lord, thank you that it comes at just the right moment, at just the right time, every time, because that's who you are. You're the ram in the thicket. You're the provision when it looks like there's no way. Thank you, Jesus, that we can trust you because of your great love for us. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, church, you're dismissed. We love you. Have a great rest of your Sunday, and we will see you next week. You don't want to miss it. Design patterns, I'm telling you, it's super cool.